a lot of things happen because a lot of people pull together for the sake of saving as many lives as we could. It was pretty simple at the end of the day. If mRNA could become a safe and effective drug, this technology uh, could change medicine forever. This is what I believed at the time. And the reason is very simple is with mRNA, you can not only do what you can do with recombinant technology, we know what biotech has used for 50 years now, but because the mRNA gets into the cells, you can make protein inside the cells or protein at the membrane of a, of a cell. And that represents around two thirds of a protein in your DNA. And you cannot do those protein using traditional technology. And so it was just basically a gigantic space of biology that you could drug that could not be drug using either a small molecule, what pharma has used for 150 years, or biotech technology, what pharma has used for 50 years. And so that, that's why I decided to do it, which is if we could find a way to make this work safely, it will change medicine forever. I told the founding team when they talked to me to join as employee number two, I told them, this is crazy, this will never work. Before I convinced myself that it might work. Uh, but my initial reaction was, this is crazy. And so I wanted it to be very clear that we are trying to do something uh, scientifically extremely complicated. But if we could find a way to make it happen, it will change medicine forever. I mean, the key for me is, is getting great people. Um, it's, it sounds easy to say. It's very hard to do execution wise. And also to always think about the next five years of a company and to always reassess, do we have a right board? Do we have a right management team for the next five years, not for what the last two years have been. And I think in the kind of hyper growth company, that's always the challenge, which is the company keeps on changing at a pace that is very unnatural. You know, when I used to work at Biomerieu or Eli Lilly, companies are very mature, you know, grow three, five, seven percent a year. And so the pace of change is slow. Right. When you work in a company with double size every year, the pace of change is very high. And I think one of the biggest risks for management across the company is to forget that the company is not the same. A lot of time, you know, when I meet with leaders at the company, I tell them, you know, I wish I could change the company name. Because I tell them the hardest thing for me to do over the last now 10 years is every day I walk into my office as the CEO of Moderna. But as you can imagine, job day number one, where I was employee number two, had no money, tried to figure out who do we hire first, where do we find a lab? That was my life back then as a CEO. Now my life is okay, how do we grow from where we are? How do we get the booster in the clinic quickly? You know, how do we hire people in Japan? Very different business challenges. But still, my job is CEO of Moderna. And so, the, the way I describe it to people, I say you need to be very careful because the company, because of its hyper growth, is boiling you like a frog. You know, raising the water temperature a little bit every day, you don't feel anything, but at the end of a year, you are totally boiled. And, and that's a piece that I always advise people to think about. And I've told them as kind of a coaching advice, what I have done is at least once per quarter, you know, spend a half day on a Sunday quietly with a pot of tea and literally a white plate of paper at my home office to think about, okay, for the next two and five years, what does more than I need from me? Where is more than I going? What should my job be? What are the new things I need to do? What are the things I need to stop doing? And this reinvention is actually really hard. Because right. if you don't do it actively, it boils you. So the TEDx mindset is a realization I had over the years that if you ask people to drive a lot of change in a short amount of time, they, they can't. Because all the rational side of their brain try to convince them that it's not possible. But if you do not put a time frame on it initially, and you just ask a 10x question very open-endedly, people become very creative. And so if you can align on where does the transformative vision of a company look like, uh, then you can walk backward to think about what needs to happen, you know, 
a year before that and a year before that and a year before that up to today to understand what change has to happen to get a 10x vision uh, because if if not people think very human brains think linearly the compounding is a totally unnatural way to think about the world right. uh, but human brain thinks linearly and so if you want to do transformative work i think you have to initially not time constrain it because if you time constrain it then people become very very rational and they cannot dream we were extremely um focused on doing great science you know the way i like to describe the company in the first two years because we had no money uh, it was what i call spaghetti science which is you try something if it sticks on a wall because it works great if it does not you try something else um, what happened to us two years into the journey is we got a big partnership signed with AstraZeneca that got us, you know, quarter billion dollar cash up front. And so we could start to do high quality science, which is your own experiments. If something doesn't work, you get the entire team across uh, the room and with a whiteboard and you start brainstorming what could explain what we did not expect. Because when you're an experiment, you expect it to work. So if it doesn't work, if some, one of your hypotheses or several of the hypotheses you had going into the experiment was incorrect. And you need to figure out which ones and you need to prove it that it was incorrect. So you can change your thinking about what you understand about the science, about the thing you are trying to do. And so we decided to do very, very high quality science. And the other piece is we're always very long term focused. We are very long term focused. Um, and when I say long term, I mean five, ten years out. Because it was very clear to us that you cannot do transformational science in six weeks or a quarter. And so we're always willing to say, let's sometime go a bit slower because we go very deep on something that doesn't work. But we're going to bounce back so strong because we're going to learn so much. For us, it has been this obsession about learning and saying we're playing a very long game. And we want to be the best company in the world we understand that science uh, and we'll be willing sometime to take a step back so that we could go then fast five steps forward because we go very deep on mechanically understanding what's going on in the early days um, it was actually hard to recruit people because most scientists would recruit or talk to they will say, what? You're trying to do mRNA as a drug? You're crazy. Uh, so a lot of people uh, did not join the company in the early days. And because we don't have a scientific leadership that we have had since then, it was indeed a big challenge to first get high, high quality enough people. And then without the scientific leadership, because the team was very, very small, to try to, uh, to guide them. What really changed our life a lot is when Stephen Hawke, who is the president of a company and running R&D, joined us two years into the com company history and then started to lead the science. Uh, that was a very transformative moment because on the one hand, we're getting more data. Two, we had the capital to do science correctly, not spaghetti science. And three, there was the right leader to lead the science because I'm not a scientist. I understand enough about the science. And so for me is how do you, the advice to other CEOs is how do you work through the transition phase? How do you go through being a very small company without the right resources to surrounding you as a CEO with the talent you need to lead the company in the expertise you don't have? It's the same thing with manufacturing, you know. I know enough about manufacturing because I'm an engineer and I worked four years at Eli Lilly Manufacturing, but I'm not as good as Juan Andres who's currently running manufacturing. He's amazing. 20 years in, in manufacturing, you know, Lily, run manufacturing for Novartis. And so it's how do you basically bridge that gap until you are able to get the right talent who can take it to the right place. Uh, and a lot of time is, is making sure that you engage people so they come up with a solution. I think management role a lot is to ask the right questions. You know, in the early days before Stephen started on the science, I didn't know the scientific answers or how to get there. 
but I was able to ask where were the key scientific question the business, the company needed answered. So we could move the business forward into getting closer to product from science. And this I could do asking the questions. But then I will I will I will try to listen a lot. And that's a skill I think that I really got out of HBS, which is getting a, a group of diverse people on the table and asking questions, not necessarily being the one able to answer every question. You know, I learned a lot about management and general management and all of the different functions that make an enterprise work. An enterprise is a system. And so if you have great manufacturing, but poor marketing or great finance and poor manufacturing, you're not going to go very far. So I think thinking about the enterprise as a, as a system where you need to keep all the PCs strong because like any chain, the weakest link defines the strength of the chain. Uh, and so, so that I really learned a lot about that. Uh, the, the piece that uh, was very profound for me is it, it always made me think a lot, uh, you know, start every case by teaching you about the context of a situation. Uh, I always ask my team about the context uh, because things evolve a lot. As I, I said earlier, you know, Moderna in the early days and two years in and now is not the same company, but still has the same name on the door. Uh, and so understanding the context. Of, of that people are dealing with, I think is very important. And this was a key piece of, of education I got from HBS. And the other piece I think is around um, the diversity of opinion. Uh, you know, I was always surprised, you know, I would you know, read a case at night, thought I had kind of really understood it and walk in a class and have a doctor or a banker or somebody from another field uh, take a very different spin on how I analyzed the case. That always made me very humble and always made me wanting to have around me a team of women and men who uh, have very different uh, personality, different experience, different training, so that we can really wrestle an issue to the ground to try to find the best outcome so we could do our job, which is to deliver on the mission of a company. And so that is what has really uh, been very profound in, in how I, HBS has shaped my thinking. We made a very conscious decision that because it was such a novel technology that could change medicine, one of our biggest risks was big pharma learning too early about our technology and killing us. Because remember, we didn't have the right people, enough capital. And so our biggest nightmare in the first three, four years of a company was we want as little people as possible at knowing what we are doing. And so this is why we did not publish. That is why for two years we had no website. I mean, think about this in today's world. Any company goes with two employees and a dog and go have a beautiful website with flashy colors and so on and try to pretend to be somebody they are not. But they wish to become. In our case, we did the exact opposite, very Moderna-like, which is we didn't do what other people do. We asked ourselves what is the best of a long-term success of a company so we can deliver on our mission to make amazing medicine for patients. That's the only thing that we were solving for. And that's a piece I think that a lot of people that were critiquing, critiquing us from the sideline totally lost is who we were as a team. We are very mission driven. I think the only thing we care about is figure out is there a way to make a safe, effective medicine using mRNA? Because if we can do it once, because mRNA is an information molecule, we can do it a lot. It's another piece that most people did not appreciate about us, which is it was very clear to all of us that this could not be a one drug company. It was either going to be zero because we run out of cash before we get a drug approved, or it was going to be a massive platform with a lot of drugs. One drug company makes zero scientific sense from the beginning. And so because of that, we had this obsession to not let patient down, to not let society down. Because we were on this big mission, which I think allowed us to have very thick skin, to stick to our guns, to our strategy, to say, we don't care about the NASA here. We don't care about people are criticizing us. We know who we are. We're doing the best job we can. We're very mission focused. Uh, and if they need to see papers to believe, well, they have to wait a few more years. On the investor front, I want to say, uh, we were always very clear about the company we wanted to build. And I've described a lot of elements. Mission driven, very deep science, long-term focused, patient focused. And so, we were very clear about who we wanted to be, what type of company we wanted to build. And so I was always very transparent. Um, 
to investors. And so we turned down investors that had different objectives, like some investors, as we are meeting with them to consider an investment, say, you need to be more product focused in the early days. And we're like, no, we want to be platform focused initially. At the right time, we will become product focused. But we think this platform can be gigantic, have an enormous impact on patients over the next 10, 20, 30 years. We don't want to limit that long-term potential by pivoting too quickly the company from platform to product. And so we were just very, very transparent of who we were, what companies wanted to build, and that uh, we, we were going to do with that, and that it was going to take a lot of time. Uh, it was going to be very risky. Uh, in the early days, you know, we got investors requesting to invest. And I said, I don't want to take any outside money until we have more key data. I thought, well, it's too, too risky. If I lose my money because I had invested, if flagship lose their money, that's fine. We walked into that situation, eyes wide open. But I had some people wanting to invest before we had monkey data, and I'm saying, I'm not taking your money. And so we've always been very disciplined and very transparent, trying to build long-term trust because it was clear it was going to take many, many years to build this company. And so there was actually no upside, only downside. So not being truthful. It's true in any relationship. Uh, it's true investors as well. And so we spent a lot of time in the early days to understand what we wanted to build and then to be very, very honest about it uh, and to be very true to ourselves, even if it meant some time, like I think in late 2014, we turned down a $200 million check from an investor uh, because he had a very different vision of what we want, what the company should become. And I told the board, look, I need to be transparent. There is this investor uh, as well. Uh, but we decided not to take his capital because we thought for the long-term sake of a company and our chance to deliver on a mission, uh, it was going to reduce our, our chance to get there. Flagship is trying to do science that has not been done before. I think Flagship is not interested to do incremental science. Um, Flagship, to my understanding, is not interested to fund companies created by other groups. Uh, flagship is interested to do groundbreaking science. Uh, and so I think that mindset of saying we're going to rather take a 5% chance to build a company who's going to change medicine versus a 95% chance to build an average biotech company of one drug and go pray every morning that we pick the right drug because, as you know, most drugs fail. I think this is kind of a flagship kind of mantra and that resonated a lot with me. The only reason it made sense for me to leave Biomario is not to try to do one drug that, you know, like going to Vegas at a 5% chance or 10% chance of launching. Uh, it was really, how can we have a very profound impact on the world? Um, and, that, and that's kind of worked for my personality as well. In the early days, because we had no money and no expertise, we partnered a lot. And as the company has developed more and more, we partnered less and less. And now if you look at the company, you know, we have shown we can do a successful phase three. We have shown we can get the FDA to authorize our products. We have shown we can commercialize products at gigantic scale. Uh, you know, we're trying to make a billion dollars this year. You know, we have delivered, you know, a lot of those to the US government and to many governments around the world. And so, uh, and we have a lot of cash now. So if you look at it, the company is sitting on, at the end of Q1, $80 billion of cash. So we have capital, we have teams, we have capabilities. So I think if you look at the forward, we will do, I think, very uh, focused partnership when they make sense. Like I think the Vertex example is a very good one. We wanted to go into the lung. Vertex wanted to figure out how to deliver a money into the lung. It was a nice partnership. Vertex is the best company in the world for cystic fibrosis. Why we hire people to reinvent the wheel? The practical answer was let's do together that one drug. But Moderna is going to go after many drugs in the lung alone. So there were two phases, I think, in how we thought about SARS CoV 2, even though at the time it had no name. So this new virus from China, we initially thought it was going to be uh, an outbreak, like SARS or MERS. So pretty short-lived, pretty local. And so uh, initially we uh, decided it was worth, given the speed of our technology, to try to be helpful. 
And so we developed the vaccine in 48 hours in computers in silico. Uh, then he went to the factory in Massachusetts to make the vaccine that indeed March 16 you know, in 60 days went into the clinic uh, with the help of Dr. Fauci's team. Uh, um, and that was kind of the initial plan to say, look, we're going to get the drug in the clinic. Hopefully it can be helpful. And that was kind of it. Uh, what really changed our view as a company was my trip to Davos the week of January, I think the 24th of, of the 20th, sorry, the January 20th of 2020. He's had a chance to spend a week with two amazing infectious disease doctors, Sir Jeremy Farah, who runs the Welcome Trust, Dr. Richard Hatchett, who runs CEPI, and uh, became very clear to me that uh, first, the data that they were getting through their network was much worse than the data we're getting in the media from China. Uh, two, that because it had already spread to quite a number of countries and it had seven to 14 days incubation time, it was already most probably present all around the world. Because, you know, if you looked at the, at the time, which I did, you know, Google flights, you realize that there were already flights to all the big capital in Asia uh, and Europe and the big uh, cities on the west coast of the US, that you realize that it was already very, uh, very, very spreading knowing the uh, long incubation time seven to two weeks seven days to two weeks and the fact that it was reported that young adults on the original strain is different now with uh, the variant uh, had a lot of case asymptomatic uh, it was pretty clear that it was already everywhere on the planet and spreading quickly because it's a respiratory virus almost the worst kind of virus in terms of, of, of speed of spreading of r not to humans uh, because we're social animals, we spend time with each other and we spend time inside in the winter and that was the winter. So so that's a bit how we pivoted the company from let's be helpful in an outbreak to uh, oh, it's going to be a pandemic like 1918 and then just rallying the team on how do we move this drug as fast as we can because it's going to be very long and very painful for the planet. But if you think about what could have happened, uh, the virus you know could have come from animals that has been reported you know as you know in china a lot of live animal in markets very close to humans sometimes you know they take the animals alive to the house sometimes they keep them in the house for days or weeks so that is not good for virus you know jumping species so that's a, a possible possible hypothesis the other one indeed is that as we know in Wuhan, there's a p4 lab this is the highest level of security lab in the world P4s, uh, and uh, human makes mistakes in any line of work. Human make mistakes, and so is it possible that some technicians, while working, you know, a full day in a lab in a very uh, heavy, high sweat, you know, complex uh, uh, protection gear, would make an accident in the lab and cut their protection gear? and infect themselves by accident even without noticing it uh, is it possible yes it's possible in any lab of that type in the world and is it possible that somebody getting infected goes back home that night and infects their family without realizing it because they don't even know they're sick because of the incubation time and then it's spread around quietly for a week or two and again some young people being asymptomatic or having what it looks like a cold in the winter will not surprise anybody. So until you start to have a few people getting to the hospital, you could have had these things spreading even a month or two uh, out there without people realizing it's bad. And by then, you know, the, the cat is out of the bag and here you go, you have a global pandemic. So right. is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Do I have any data making me believe it is a uh, human mistake in Wuhan with virus escaping the lab versus the market hypothesis? I have no data to believe once in a home of an hour from a probability standpoint but it is possible so we're still very focused on getting the job done the job is not finished i know uh for you know having a chance this weekend to walk around boston going to lunch with my wife that it's just amazing feeling to see people outside with no mask you know together hugging each other and going to restaurants and having a life again so that feels wonderful obviously uh but the job is not done you know uh latin america still has incredible outbreaks you know, Southeast Asia has incredible outbreaks. We've all followed closely, you know, the human tragedy in India recently. Uh, the UK, as you, you, you know, 
is very worried of uptick in cases because of a Delta variant. And so the job is not done until the planet is vaccinated, which I believe will happen in the second half of 2022. Um, there is no way in the world in which this can happen this year, just because there's not enough manufacturers. And if you think about it, mRNA being a new technology, there was zero manufacturing capacity existing in the world when we started chasing this virus. Everything has been built. Yes, the output is going up month by month, week by week, but it's not yet enough to provide vaccines for everybody. Um, and so uh, the job is not done. And so the team is still very focused, like I'm sure it's the case at our vaccine companies, uh, to, to make as many doses as we can uh, to get also the pediatric uh, young uh, children uh, indication approved so that we can really vaccinate everybody because the last thing we need in the fall is a new variant infecting a child, having mild symptoms, infecting parents or grandparents, and we go back into hospitalization and go back into lockdowns. So the job is not finished and we're very focused on it. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very serious risk. We don't have enough data today to know which variant is going to come in the future. But even if you look at some of the new variants, like, you know, Delta, for example, as I was mentioning in the UK, in the UK, you have a lot of people that have been vaccinated with adenovirus vaccine, because as we know, the UK has been mostly AstraZeneca, more recently Pfizer, Moderna. But you see people that were vaccinated six months ago starting to get uh, infected again, same thing in India. Uh, and so uh, I really believe we're going to need to boost people, uh, ideally with variant specific booster, so that we teach your immune system the new code of a new virus circulating or the old virus that is 18 months old so that you can be the best the best protected possible so that you can right. go for the winter without risk so so i believe that the variants of concern have that name not by accident from the who and the public health experts uh, i believe through booster and vaccinating the population we're going to get this under control but as i said it is in my opinion more than a year from now we believe this is going to be, become endemic. This virus is not leaving the planet. Yeah. Uh, and so we believe we're going to need regular boosting. One of the exciting projects we're working on at Moderna is to combine in the same dose uh, a COVID variant booster and flu seasonal booster into a single shot. You can get at your local CVS or GP or pediatrician, you know, in the right. September time frame, and you have a nice fall and winter. That's what we're working towards. In the last 18 months have been extremely intense. Uh, I have to give uh, extraordinary uh, kudos to the team for uh, the work ethics, the personal sacrifice. I mean, literally we have worked you know, seven days a week you know, for 18 months uh, at some time in you know, a very high personal sacrifice. And uh, people had an incredible sense of duty. You know, uh, not once I had to ask people to work more, or to keep pushing or to do something more. Uh, people always, that's what is, I think, really amazing about human beings. I mean, the sense of protecting others, of helping others is very strong, you know, in us as a species. Uh, and so uh, it has been really a privilege to lead the team. It has been about about framing the, the problems, framing the priorities making trade-off decision because a lot of time you want A and B and C and you can only do A or B or C. And part of management is to, you know, mingle with the team to figure out, do we understand the upside and the downside of every decision and then deciding? Because as you know, in a time of crisis, uh, indecision can be fatal. Um, and so I think that's what we have been through as a team. Again, given the extraordinary situation, uh, it made it almost easier for all of us versus normal business time. We were chasing this virus. We knew every day mattered. Uh, we got a lot of people helping us. You know, Operation Bar Speed was amazing with General Perna and Monsef, Dr. Monsef Slawi, just amazing. The funding we got through Congress via Barda from the US government to allow us to not compromise quality or safety, to uh, but to go really fast uh, because we had financial resources to do everything as we could in parallel without compromising safety. So, uh, you know, our manufacturing partners, so I can, uh, the FDA in terms of a sp the speed of a review has been phenomenal. I've not seen that in 25 years being in the business. 
And so a lot of things happened because a lot of people pulled together for the sake of saving as many lives as we could. What we know today is the vaccine uh, modality, as we call it, so vaccine applications uh, are working very nicely as, as the world learned in the last you know, six to nine months. Uh, and we believe we can do dozens of vaccines like this with exactly the same technology. You just change the order of the four letters of life on the message, like zeros and one on a piece of software, and you go make another vaccine. And we have nine right now in development. We're going to have many more coming soon that are being worked on in the labs right now that are not yet in clinical development. They're going to come very soon. And so I think we're going to totally disrupt the entire vaccine business forever. Then we have five other applications that are on the therapeutic side from getting into the liver to treat rare genetic disease in the liver to cancer to cardiology. So we are working uh, with our colleagues at Vertex to get mRNA through your mouth into your lungs. Um, and we announced a few weeks ago at our annual science day that we've developed a new delivery system to get mRNA via an IV to go into your stem cell in your body. You can do a lot of cool things <clears throat> in terms of organ regeneration, in terms of autoimmune disease and so on uh, that we're very excited about. So if you ask me, what do I believe? I believe in the next, you know, 10 to 20 years, there will be most probably five to 10 to 15 different family of medicines. Each family of medicine could be 10 to 20 to 40 different drugs. So it's a very, very broad platform that I believe over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years is going to really uh, disrupt medicine in very profound way. I mean, we talked about vaccine a lot because of the COVID-19 vaccine. That's how the company is known. But one drug, for example, I'm very interested about is a drug which is a therapeutic called VEGF. It's V-E-G-F. It's the name of a, of a protein you have in your DNA. Uh, and uh, that protein we inject in people's heart after a heart attack right now. Uh, and the physics behind this drug is if you survive a heart attack, you are going to most probably die of a heart failure because your heart ability to pump blood, your heart muscle has been so damaged during the infarct by lack, among other things, of oxygen to your heart muscle. That if you survive a heart attack, you're going to have a heart failure, meaning you're going to live between your bed and your sofa all day long. You won't be able to do much. Well, what if you could inject in the heart within 48 hours of the infarct mRNA coding for the protein VEGF? And the physics behind this, which we showed in pigs, the phase one looks very good, and now it's in phase two in people's heart, is if VEGF will get stem cell coming from your bone marrow into your heart muscle where you inject the, the drug to build brand new blood vessels. VEGF you use when you cut yourself. If you cut yourself and you bleed, it's because you sectioned blood vessels. And you bleed because the blood is leaving the blood vessel, the pipes. So when you cut yourself, your body will make at the site of a cut, will make VEGF protein. VEGF has almost like a little flag telling the stem cell, hey guys, there's a problem here, come here. And they build a brand new baby like blood vessel. And so the idea is to drug that protein in people's heart. Okay? So just have to give you a sense of a type of things that look like science fiction in medicine. Right. We are already doing in the clinic uh, that we think has a high chance of working. Uh, and there's many, many more to come. So indeed, I think there's been two amazing scientific discovery around the world in the last 10 years that have totally changed as we as an industry think about cancer. First is that it's now well understood that cancer is a disease of your DNA. A cancer cell is basically a cell that goes uh, crazy, quote unquote, because it has, you know, mutation in its DNA. It's not like a natural cell of your body, a healthy cell sorry, of your body anymore. Uh, and the second piece that we learned is that T cell in your white cells, T cells job is to eat cancer cells like Pac-Man. And so once you understand those two things, it's a huge step forward for the industry to start to understand what do you do in terms of drug application to leverage those two scientific fundamental discoveries. And so that's what we're trying to do now. So today we have five drugs in the clinic. 
some were trying to teach your immune system via a vaccine uh, what from your cancer cell it has been missing because if you develop cancer as a disease it's because your immune system was not able to eat your cancer cells when your cancer cells emerge in your body it is now known in the field that all of us have already had many times cancer in our lives even if we've never been sick with cancer and that if you're healthy if you sleep well if you eat well if you do sport a healthy immune system will go and eat your cancer cell early like pac-man and so you will not develop you know large tumors that will then start to metastase and go all over your body and so that's one approach is using cancer vaccines to teach your immune system mutation of your cancer so genetic mutation of the dna of your cancer that your immune system did not see because you were unhealthy because you had a big stress in your life you went for a divorce you lost a kid if you look a lot of time people have cancer 10 years after having had a trauma in their life uh, and also of course people get more cancer as they get older because the immune system becomes weaker um, the other approach we're having is to inject mrna straight into tumors to try to do protein in your tumor that if you were to give those protein all around your body via a natural IV, like traditional medicine, you'll get you very sick because they're very, very potent, nasty molecules. But if you can give it to you very local in a tumor by injecting directly into the tumor, it's a little bit like a biopsy, but instead of pulling on a needle, you press and the product in your in your tumor, then you can have an effect there. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with cancer. We're trying to combine our mRNA medicine with other medicine in cancer to get a better response for people that have cancer. So we believe I don't know if I will use the word cure, which is a very loaded word in our industry, but I think you can get to a, a place of treatment where you can live a very healthy life with cancer. Some people might, be, might get cured. That's already the case with you know, immunotherapy when it works. But some people might just be able to live with a cancer. Like people live with diabetes, you know, today. If you control well your, your blood glucose, you can live with diabetes to very, very old age, a very healthy, healthy uh, active life but you still have a disease of diabetes. So it's a bit of how we think about cancer, which is while some people might get cured, many people might just live with a cancer, with a, a very high quality life. And that would be one of them. We're talking again years, not decades. You already have had a lot of wonderful drugs coming from the industry. And what we're trying to do with mRNA is to build complementary drugs, to be injected with a pharma drug, to get a better response, so that you get more people that will have, let's say, a complete response or cure. Moderna pre-COVID was to launch our first vaccine as CMV, cytomegalovirus, the number one cause of birth defect in this country and around the world, more than Down syndrome, uh, in the 24-25 timeframe. So we'll have been a few more years <coughs> working on our clinical plan, getting more drugs to the clinic, uh, raising more money every 12 to 18 to 24 months to the capital market, to get to that place, very much like other biotech companies that have come to market I mean, sorry, become commercial, have been successful at doing. I think Inalum is one of the better examples. It's RNAi. It's a technology doing the opposite of what we do. They don't make protein. They turn off protein from your body. Uh, rare disease company. Uh, they have, I think, now four products approved. Uh, and they developed over a 20-year time frame. And they did roughly what I described. Um, so we know it was possible. There was a plan. Uh, because, of course, none of us you know, planned for a uh, once-in-a-century pandemic.